Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing the 11th lecture of the Introduction to Chinese Studies. The topic is Chinese Political System, the Party State. Now, this is a bit complex because uh, the Chinese system is different from the usual constitutional democratic systems in the familiar countries like United States, India, United Kingdom. Firstly, we must uh, look at the map of China to understand that there are two Chinas. One is the People's Republic of China, that is the mainland. So this is the People's Republic of China. This entire thing here is the People's Republic of China because it is ruled by the Communist Party of China. So they have, they named it the People's Republic of China. It was founded on 1st of October 1949. The other China is this island of Taiwan. This was founded by the Kuomintang. Kuomintang. Led by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, this is called the Republic of China. So, Republic of China before 1949 was the entire China. Entire China was the Republic of China. Then there was a civil war from 1945 to 49 in which the Kuomintang was defeated and the Chinese Communist Party took over the entire mainland. Uh, and the Republic of China government went into exile into this island of Taiwan. So there are some smaller islands also. This is the Taiwan Straits, this sea between the two entities. This is called the Taiwan Straits. There are some islands which are known as the first line of defense of, of Taiwan. So both uh, the countries follow what is known as the one China policy. In, in, within Taiwan, there is a debate whether they should continue with that or assert their independence. Uh, but right now, the official position is a one China policy for both the entities. What it means is each entity claims to be the uh, the legitimate government for the entire China, not just the part that they administer directly, but also the other entity. So, People's Republic of China considers Taiwan to be one of the provinces that they have to reunite with the motherland. Similarly, the Republic of China claims that the Chinese mainland is also part of their territory, which has been illegitimately taken over by the communists. So, this is known as the one China policy. So, when we are, we are discussing the political system of China, we are talking about the People's Republic of China. We are not going to discuss the political system in Taiwan. I can briefly mention that uh, initially it was ruled through uh, what is known as political tutelage, a one party rule of the Kuomintang led by Chiang Kai-shek. After the death of Chiang Kai-shek, there were a couple of more rulers and then eventually uh, Taiwan became a democratic country in the 1990s. Okay, so today, Taiwan is a vibrant democracy and a well-to-do nation. On the other hand, China is under the one-party rule of the communists. Of course, there are some smaller parties known as democratic parties, there are eight democratic parties which also have some uh, uh, you know positions in the uh, the parliament and, and and government but they are all subordinate to the communist party of china the communist party of china occupies the overwhelming majority almost 90% of the seats in the in the parliament okay we are going to discuss all those things in details uh, so these are the various administrative divisions you can see in the map there are different administrative divisions of uh, China. In the pink, you can see these are the provinces of China. 
Okay, some of the provinces are traditional provinces which existed even in the imperial times. Some of them are newly created uh, provinces, especially say the autonomous regions. In the in the yellow light yellow, you can see the autonomous regions. These are the regions where minorities are in substantial number. China is almost uh, ninety percent, more than ninety percent Han Chinese. That is their mother language is Chinese. Okay, so they are known as Han Chinese. The minorities are those uh, nationalities which speak non-Chinese languages. For example, the Tibetans speak the Tibetan language, or the Uyghurs they speak a Turkic language, which is the U Uyghur language, or they are the uh, the Mongols. Okay, so these are some of the minorities. There are other minorities, for example, religious minorities. We uh, the we are Muslims. Okay, so by religion they are Muslims, so they are also considered to be minority. So, in this way there are, if I am right there are 22 provinces and uh, 5 autonomous regions. Okay, one for the Mongols, one for the Hui, one for the Uyghurs, one for the Tibetans and another for the Chuang. Chuang is another minority. Then there are uh, 4 municipalities. These are large cities which are directly ruled by the central government. Of course, China is a unitary state, so ultimately uh, it is the central government which is the, there, 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 is no, there is no division of power between the central government and the provinces. Whatever the, whatever uh, uh, responsibilities the central government gives to the provinces, they are autonomous to follow. So in practice, there is some autonomy, but uh, legally there is, uh, the provinces do not have any separate existence uh, than the, uh, the central government. Okay, so there are four municipalities, Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai and Chungcheng. Okay, you can see in the green, these are the four municipalities. And there are two special administrative regions. Now, these were former European colonies, which were then uh, returned to China. So, these two special administrative regions are Hong Kong and Macau. Now, Hong Kong was ruled by the British in 1997, it was returned to China and Macau was ruled by the Portuguese, it was returned in 1999-2000 to the Chinese. Now, these are special administrative regions because China follows what is known as one country, two systems. So, there are certain laws which are followed in these uh, SARs, which the Chinese government does not interfere in. So, they have lot of autonomy. Basically, uh, this was the condition of, of decolonization, the colonial powers, they said that China, uh, uh, these, these uh, colonies or regions should not come under uh, the direct rule of the Chinese Communist Party. So, they have kind of a, a quasi democratic type of a setup, their elections and their multi parties and there is rule of law in this. So, Macau is known uh, famous for gambling, uh, which is prohibited in the rest of China. And Hong Kong, of course, is a quite uh, prosperous uh, uh, city. Okay, so, this is the basic uh, overview of China. So, this is the basic administrative setup of the People's Republic of China. Now, uh, China is ruled by the Communist Party, as I had said before. So, you must look at the system. Okay, it's, you have to be very careful here because it's, it's a bit complex type of a system. The head of the Communist Party is the, the, the most powerful leader in China. Okay, so, before the People's Republic of China was formed, there were several um, uh, leaders of the Communist Party. They were either called the chairman or the general secretary. The titles have changed from time to time. So, you can see here 1921. The Communist Party was formed. Chan Tu Shu was the first uh, head of the Communist Party. Then you have Xiang Chung Fa, okay, from 28 to 31. Xiang was uh, disillusioned with the with, with communism towards the end of his life, but he was uh, executed by the Kuomintang nonetheless. He was uh, arrested and and then executed by the Kuomintang. Then Po Ku was the leader from 31 to 35. Uh, he was uh, supported by the, the Soviets. 
com intern c o m i n communist international okay unfortunately under him the communists were several times defeated by the komintang and so he was found to be inefficient and so he was also removed and chang wen tian uh, was the leader general secretary from 35 to 43 and uh, eventually he was overthrown by mao zedong in uh, when he started the party rectification okay so he mao zedong he gradually became the leader of the people's liberation army the um, the military wing of the communist party and uh, in the yanan uh, camp yan an camp and uh, he uh, was able to concentrate powers in his hand and 43 he became the chairman undisputed chairman of the communist and he remained the chairman till his death so it is mao zedong who founded the uh, the people's republic of china after that mao became the paramount leader so he, he was the leader of china the paramount leader the supreme leader of china and he also remained the head of the military the central military commission as well as the chairman of the communist party okay so power was concentrated in his hands he was also the head of the state for uh, uh, almost a decade more than a decade in fact uh, but in 1959 he gave up that post to uh, liu shaoqi but he remained the paramount leader nonetheless okay so head of the state does not mean that you are the most powerful uh, leader in china the primary requirement is you must have control over the party and the military now just before the death of mao mao appointed hua kuofang this is hua kuofang as the successor he was appointed as the vice chairman and as soon as mao died uh, he was chosen as the so the the remaining uh, leaders they chose him as the chairman it was an automatic choice of mao had nominated him so uh, his influence and power led to hua kuofang to be to become the next leader although hua kuofang himself was not a very uh, very powerful leader within the party he was a less known uh, leader but mao felt that he would be able to continue the his legacy he will continue mao's legacy but because he was not very powerful he was o- eventually overtaken in 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 uh, influence by tang xiaoping okay tang xiaoping because he was a party veteran very influential within the military as well as the party cadre so by 1978 during the 11th uh, during the uh, third plenum of the 11th party congress he emerged as the the paramount leader of the communist party but you will notice that he was never head of the communist party okay he allowed hua kuofang to remain the chairman okay so although he was the paramount leader he never took the position of the chairman of the party soon uh, Huo Kuofang was forced to retire and he was replaced by the proteges of Tang Xiaoping. Hu Yaopang he became the new chairman and in 1982 the constitution of the party was uh, a new constitution was introduced and the post of chairman was abolished and a new post of general secretary was created. So since then the head of the party has been the general secretary so hu yaopang was the general secretary till 1987 when uh, there was a protest and he was uh, uh, not willing to crack down on the protesters he he basically supported political reforms and therefore the party elders who were very wary of any kind of political instability in china because they wanted to focus on economic development they removed him and instead appointed another protege of uh, tang xiaoping chao xiang uh, he was appointed in 1987 replacing hu yao pang uh, hu yao pang he died in 1989 and again there was protest and people came out uh, gr- grieving his death and there was demand for political reforms and this time chao xiang also 
showed favor towards the protesters. He went to the protest, the students who were protesting and he, and he said that uh, there's need for change and but uh, no one will listen to you. So go back home. It is not safe and so on. And, and this was intolerable to the party elders led by Tang Xiaoping. So they sent the military to crack down on the protesters. Uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre, 1989, and Chao Chiang was removed from office. And instead of him, the leader of uh, the Shanghai branch of the party, Shanghai is one of the large cities in China, Chiang Zemin, he was made the new general secretary of the Communist Party. Okay. And Unlike the previous uh, general secretaries, Chiang Zemin was also allowed to become the paramount leader. Okay, he became the paramount leader in 1989. Uh, Tang Xiaoping and the other elders gradually retired. Although Tang Xiaoping remained, uh, uh, you know, in control, uh, he, uh, for, for example, 1992, he went on the sou uh, southern tour and and said that China will continue the economic reform, thus, thus giving an indication to uh, Jiang Zemin that he should uh, speed up the economic reform. So he had influence till his death in 1997. But the paramount leader was Jiang Zemin because he controlled the party as well as the Central Military Commission. He was also made the chairman of the Central Military Commission. Okay, so this is Jiang Zemin. Chiang Zemin was the, uh, the paramount leader of China from uh, 1989 to 2002, after which he was succeeded by Hu Chintao. Okay. So he was from 2002 to 2012, and then he was succeeded by Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is right now the paramount leader of China. Now, the interesting thing here is Chiang Zemin, he had uh, a power base. Okay, he has supporters from Shanghai mostly, and therefore the the people that he promoted and during his tenure, whoever uh, you know occupied important offices, they came to be known as the Shanghai clique. Okay, the Shanghai clique. Shanghai clique. Uh, now, uh, Chiang Zemin was selected by Tang Xiaoping. Uh, uh, similarly, he had, uh, Tang Xiaoping had also selected Hu Chintao to be the successor to Chiang Zemin. So, he, this is known as the grandfathering process. So, he selected his successor and also the successor of his successor. Now, Hu Chintao was, uh, uh, did not belong to the Shanghai clique. He came from the uh, Communist Youth League. Okay, so he is known as the youth leaguer or Thuan Pai, Thuan Pai or youth leaguer. Now, when he became the paramount leader, Jiang Zemin had filled all the important offices with his own people, the Shanghai clique. And therefore, Hu Jintao was not as powerful as Jiang Zemin when he was the paramount leader. Most of the offices were occupied by the Shanghai clique, which remained very, very powerful. Of course, Hu Jintao was also able to uh, manage to get uh, some of his people into office, but most majority of the people uh, were from the Shanghai clique. So, Jiang Zemin remained very powerful even under Hu Jintao. Uh, in fact, he for a couple of years, he remained the chairman of the Central Military Commission. It is only in 2004 that he relinquished that office to Hu Jintao. Now, Hu Jintao was succeeded by Xi Jinping. Now, Xi Jinping uh, was neither from the Shanghai clique nor the youth league. He was a princeling. Okay. Princeling. Maybe the spelling may be wrong. I think it's okay. Let me let it be. So, princeling, please look it up. Xi Jinping was a princeling. The princeling means uh, the children of former communist leaders. Now, these were the leaders who, you know, 
played a very important role in the foundation of the Communist Party and the People's Republic. Uh, so their children, because their uh, fathers were part of the Communist Party, they, they received some uh, advantage in, in politics. Okay. So, so this also is a kind of a faction. Now, of course, each princeling has, 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 has his own political ambitions. So, uh, for example, under Hu Jintao, a famous rival of Xi Jinping was Po Si Lai. Po Si Lai. Okay, po Si Lai was a rival to uh, Xi Jinping. He was the party secretary of uh, Chungcheng uh, city. But he was many criminal charges were brought against him, and during uh, Hu Jintao's period, he was removed from power and arrested and tried. And so that paved the way for Xi Jinping to emerge as, as the uh, leader. Uh, the father of uh, Xi Jinping was uh, Xi Chung Sun. Xi Chung Sun. Uh, po Si Lai's father was Po E Po. Okay, so both of them were very senior communist leaders. Uh, part of, uh, of course, they were pers persecuted by Mao Zedong during the uh, Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, as most of the leaders were. But once Mao died, they came back to power. They were all part of 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 the uh, the senior leaders under Tang Xiaoping. So Xi Jinping is now the paramount leader. Now, what Xi Jinping has done after coming to power is he has gradually removed all the power bases of the previous leaders okay, through his anti-corruption campaign. Okay, so the Shanghai clique has basically been eliminated and Jiang Zemin himself has died now. Similarly, he has also sidelined all the youth leaguers. During his first two terms, Li Keqiang was the premier. Okay, so he belonged to the youth league. Uh, but uh, the, in, the, in the third term, so Xi Jinping has now entered the third term of power and uh, uh, Li Keqiang has been removed and, he, and, and replaced by uh, a supporter of Xi Jinping. And so Xi Jinping has cons consolidated power in his own hands. So he is the undisputed leader and uh, he might continue for a long time. Uh, so long as his health uh, permits, he is going to, it seems that he is going to remain in power. So this is the basic idea that the, communi that the Communist Party rules over China and there is a paramount leader who is like a dictator basically. Okay, so till Xi Jinping came to power, there was a kind of a collective leadership. So between Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping, there was collective leadership of the Communist Party. Uh, but otherwise, the paramount leader, you can say, is more or less like a dictator who rules over everyone and everyone has to obey the line, follow the line set by the dictator. Now let's look at the government. So that is the party. Now let's look at the government, the state. So there are two important positions, one that of the head of the state, the other the premier of the state council. State council is like the cabinet, so there is the meeting of the ministers. So head of the state council or the cabinet is known as the premier or what we call prime minister in our country or some in, in, in parliamentary democracies. The other is the head of the state who is equivalent to the president of the country. Now the position of the president over time has also changed, it has not remained the same. Okay. So Mao Zedong was the first head of the state. So he was called the chairman. So he, he did not use the title of the president. That is the, in the English translations, the term chairman was used. So Mao Zedong was the chairman from 1949 to 59. And as I said, he was succeeded by Liu Shaoqi. Mao remained the leader, but Liu Shaoqi became the head of the state. Now he was removed during the cultural revolution, beaten up, tortured, denied medication and he died. He was attacked by the red guards, young, young uh, students who attacked him and he eventually died. After his death, the chairman was not replaced. Okay, the, there were two vice uh, chairperson, Sung Ching Ling. Uh, Sung Ching Ling was the wife of Sun Yat-sen, Sun Yat-sen the father of the 
first revolution, Sinhai revolution. Okay, so uh, she was his wife, but she did not side with Komintang. Her, her sister was married to Chiang Kai shek, but she remained in the People's Republic of China. She supported the communists and uh, she, wa she was the leader of, of uh, the revolutionary committee of the Kuomintang. So, the Ko so, a branch of the Kuomintang, which remained in the People's Republic, they were recognized as one of the democratic parties and they supported the communist rule in China. So, Sung uh, Ching Ling remained in China and she was also the, the vice uh, chairwoman of, of the People's Republic. So, in that capacity, she, was, she, she became the acting head of the state. In 1972, Tung Piu, Tung Piu was uh, another vice chairman and he, he, he was chosen as the acting president or the acting chairman. Okay, so, they were the head of the state. In 1975, a new constitution was introduced in which the post of the chairman was abolished. And uh, according to that constitution, the new uh, head of the state would be the chair, chairman of the National People's Congress. National People's Congress is the parliament. We are going to see all the institutions and the structures of, of government later. So, so in that capacity, Chu Te became the, the head of the state. Chu Te one of, was one of the leaders of the first generation of the Communist Party, along with Mao Zedong and uh, Chou Enlai. Okay, Chu Te was one of the three great leaders of, of the first generation of the Communist Party. So, he, he remained and died uh, in 76 and he was again uh, succeeded by Sung Ching Ling, who was the vice chairwoman of the National People's Congress. So, she in that capacity, she was the acting head of the state again. And then uh, she was replaced by Ye Qian Ying. Okay. So, he, he uh, succeeded her as the head of the state. And then uh, according to the 1982 constitution, the post of the president was reintroduced. So, you can see number 3. So, Liu, after Liu Shaoqi, the next president was Li Xiannian, okay, one of the party elders. And uh, then he was succeeded by Yang Shang Kung, okay, uh, Yang Shang Kun. Now, both of them were nominal heads of state. So, although they were the president, they were not the direct executive power within China. They, of course, as party elders, they played a very important role. They were part of the advisory uh, uh, council led by Tang Xiaoping, uh, uh, Tang Xiaoping but uh, they, they were not directly ruling over China. Okay. So, instead, the premier of the state council looked after the administrative affairs of the state. Okay. Now, in 1993, Jiang Zemin became the, the president of China. So, thus in 1993, he became the president. He already was the general secretary of the Communist Party. He was also the chairman of the Central Military Commission. Thus, all the three important positions within China came under one person. So, he became the most powerful person in, in China, exercising power over everyone else. Okay. And similarly, Hu Chintao also uh, became the president in 2003. Central Military Commission came to him in 2004. After that, he also occupied the three most powerful positions in China. And then, Xi Jinping replaced Hu Jintao as the President, General Secretary as well as the Chairman of the Central Military Commission. So, these are the head of, heads of state of China. Now, the first Premier of, of China was Zhou Enlai, the legendary uh, leader and foreign policy expert. Uh, so, his tenure, he, he was the longest serving Premier from 1949 until his death in 1976, he remained the premier of China and he directly controlled the foreign affairs of China. After his death, he was replaced by Hua Kuofang. Now, interestingly, Hua Kuofang was the only paramount leader to also be the premier because there was no post of the, of the state uh, chairman at that time. So, he was the head of the party, he was head of the military as the chairman of the 
Central Military Commission. He was also the Premier of the State Council. Okay, so so he was in this way uh, the paramount leader. Then uh, he was replaced by Chao Chiang as the Premier. Chao Chiang basically introduced the reforms of of uh, Tang Xiaoping. Uh, he uh, he remained the premier till 1987 when he was promoted to the post of the general secretary of the communist party replacing hu yaopang and uh, instead of him li pang became the the premier he remained premier for 11 years li pang li pang was also a a princeling uh, but he was conservative so under him the reforms went uh, into uh, you know a, a back burner initially but then after 1992 when uh, uh, tang xiaoping emphasized that reform should continue reforms went back on track he was replaced by a very important reformer chu rongchi okay chu rongchi was the premier from 98 to 2003 he was very famous for his reforms he under him uh, china became a member of world trade organization uh, his protege Wen Jiapao became the next premier he also was a reformer he belonged to the he he, he basically uh, joined the youth leaguer camp of Hu Jintao he was a premier under Hu Jintao as you can see here i have matched the head of the state and the premiers then under Xi Jinping Li Keqiang who belonged to the faction of Hu Jintao became the premier but after 10 years he was replaced okay so now uh, the premier of uh, china is li chang okay li chang is the current premier of china recently elected in 2023 this year now it stated that china is a one party state led by the communist party and so the constitution of the people's republic of china is subject to what the communist party wants so it does not have a constitution which has lasted for a very long time um so it has had several constitutions during the course of its modern history the first constitution was the 1949 common program which was not really a constitution it was just a kind of understanding between the different uh, political parties under the communist party okay so it was adopted by an institution known as chinese people's political consultative conference cp pcc okay so the communist party and the eight democratic parties they sent their representatives in this conference and they decided on a common program just after the defeating the kuomintang okay in the civil war so based on this common program the people's republic of china was inaugurated by mao zedong now once uh, uh, this was introduced china went for land reforms you know they fought in the korean war and 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 we were able to ward off uh, uh, america and the united nations from north korea and uh, the landlords and and the the kuomintang sympathizers were purged from from various offices and so the power of the communist party was solidified and uh, so by 1954 they adopted a new new constitution and this was done by what came to be known as the national people's congress which is the parliament of china so in 1954 the first constitution so first was the common program then came the first constitution was adopted now this constitution continued till the cultural revolution so in the cultural revolution mao targeted the party leadership he did not really care about the constitutional process he basically believed in mobilizing the masses uh he used that to remove his rivals one by one and uh, you know he was the absolute dictator without any constitutional restrictions on his powers but eventually as a human being he died so in 1976 uh, just before that he he decided to constitutionalize whatever was done in the cultural revolution so a new constitution was introduced the second constitution which uh, basically supported the changes that he made uh during the cultural revolution including abolishing the post of the uh, state chairman but he died in 76 and he was replaced by hua kuofang who uh, followed this policy of two whatevers so although he he purged the 
the main culprits of the cultural revolution the gang of four and and some others but he followed the line that cultural revolution and mao zedong were not wrong okay uh, so so to adjust for these changes he introduced a new constitution the third constitution in 1978 okay but when he was replaced uh, from power by uh, tang xiaoping uh, he introduced another constitution the fourth constitution and the current constitution of the people's republic that is the 1982 constitution uh, it was adopted keeping in mind the new reform and opening policy adopted by china to to encourage uh, economic development in china okay it restored many of the things already existing in 1954 constitution it was a kind of a going back to the original uh, principles of the people's republic so this is the constitution and and uh, every 5 years there there are major changes made to the constitution one of the famous ones uh, was recently recently i mean uh, uh, i think it was in the second term that uh, in in uh, xi jinping had introduced uh, was it the first time it's i think the first time itself he, he introduced this change uh, that uh, there would be no term limits for the president otherwise there were two term limits a, a person could be president of china only for two terms that is 5 years each that is total 10 years but xi jinping amended the constitution and now there are no term limits so that he could continue for the third term and perhaps he would continue even after that so this is the constitution of people's republic now the people's republic of china is governed by certain ideological doctrines okay and the constitution mentions marxism leninism mao zedong thought tang xiaoping theory theory of three represents scientific outlook on development and xi jinping thought on socialism with chinese characteristics for a new era so this long uh, ideological doctrine is mentioned in the constitution i think i won't have enough time to discuss uh, each of the comp let's try to discuss some of them so the first idea is marxism which comes from the writings of karl marx and frederick engels now what does marxism constitute marxism has base and superstructure so marx believed that that in the society economics is the base everything is is based on the economic relations between people okay so there are forces of production that is the material components of of the economy like land labor capital these are the forces of production that that actually are involved in producing things and there are relations of production that is someone owns the uh, the forces and there are others who sell their labor they basically work for the owners so the relation between the owners and the workers that is relations of production which is an exploitative relation okay so that is the base of a society which is based on exploitation now this base is then used to create a superstructure in the society which is basically the culture the state religion family system media education so all these come under the superstructure the superstructure are based on the base okay so uh, if the base is exploitative and then the superstructure is also geared towards exploitation okay so they support the owners basically so that they do by controlling the mind of the workers so the workers are unable to go against this exploitative system so that is the the superstructure so so the components of the superstructure religion for example so marx believed that uh, religion is used by the by the owner class to you know, create an illusion a kind of a hope for the workers that okay they are suffering now but in the after life they are going to be uh, they will they will be happy and so if they if they pray to god they go to the church they they get themselves baptized if they have faith so they are going to even though they are suffering in this life in the after life they are going to be 
happy. Okay, so he considered religion to be the opium of the masses. So it gives them temporary relief. As, as a result, it allows the ruling class to control them. So China believes in this doctrine. Okay, and, and then the state. The state is the instrument in the hands of the oppressive class according to Karl Marx. Okay, so in case the people revolt, the workers revolt or try to organize themselves, the state through the laws and uh, through police and judiciary and the army, they try to, to crack down on the workers, to use violence in order to intimidate the uh, working class. So the state is also an instrument in the hands of the ruling class. Then of course the media and the education system is used to brainwash the workers, the new generation telling them they should follow these uh, uh, existing norms and, and that is the way society is, that is the way the reality is and, th and don't allow them to be radicalized. And then the family. So Marx was also against the traditional family system. He believed that family is the, the home of conservatism. It is the family which discourages the youth to, you know, think differently. They want them to, you know, uh, they tie them down in, 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 in chains according to Marx. So there is a need for men and women to break free from family bondages and become liberated. And, and, and so uh, these are some of the ideas within the base and superstructure. So once the, these, these things are uh, addressed, once the base is overthrown once the communist party uh, so of course uh, he did not talk about the communist party once the proletariat because of ex excessive oppression they overthrow this exploitative system then the superstructure will also change with the base the superstructure will also change so that was the idea of marxism the, another idea is historical materialism that history progresses through this uh, this process of opposing forces. Okay, so the exploiter and the exploited, there is a tension between them. As a result, a new class is created and that new class then leads to a creation of a new society. Okay, so it is the forces of production first change, there is technological advancement. So new economy emerges, in this new economy a new class emerges, which then demands more power, it becomes more powerful and then it overthrows the old exploitative class and a new exploitative class is created. So say from a feudal society, it becomes a capitalist society. In the feudal society, it is the aristocrats who are the ruling class. Uh, in the capitalist society, it is the, the bourgeois or the say the traders and, uh, and business people, they become the new ruling class. And they gradually demand more power, democracy, parliament are introduced, the, for a revolution like the French Revolution happens. Okay. So, he divided history into different stages. So, there is historical, uh, so there is a primitive communism, then there is slave society, then uh, feudal society, then capitalist society and then socialist society. So, he said eventually the capitalists will be overthrown by the new working class that has emerged and then uh, gradually the classes will disappear under the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is when the workers are ruling, they eventually will will get rid of all classes and there, there, there would be no need for any more state and so there will be a classless and stateless society or a communist society. So this is the kind of a prediction that Marx made. Okay. So that is known as historical materialism. So the Chinese state believes in all this. They believe that there is a base and superstructure okay. and, and history moves through this systematic process of change. So China is a socialist society, uh, although this socialist society is not very developed. So this is known as the primary stage of socialism. As you can see here, Tang Xiaoping introduced this concept. Mao Zedong himself, he believed, uh, initially he believed in new democracy. He believed that China cannot immediately become a socialist society or there cannot be a dictatorship of the proletariat immediately after uh, foundation of the People's Republic. He believed that there should be a period of new democracy. There is a coalition of the working class in which he also included the peasants. So the peasants and workers supported by the other classes. So they will all come together and there will be people's democratic dictatorship. So there will be representative of all these classes. 
those who are patriotic to uh, to uh, socialist china uh, or, or or say china patriotic to china and they will remove all the enemy classes as the landlords the comprador class and the and the Kuomintang, this bureaucratic capitalism that is the term used in china so so he advocated that initially but gradually he came to believe that there are capitalist roaders within the communist party so you know although the base has changed the base has changed the property had been nationalized land had been collectivized but capitalist mindset remained within the capitalist mindset remained within the leaders of the communist party so especially he targeted liu shaoqi and tang xiaoping sorry tang xiaoping but once mao died and uh, tang xiaoping came to power he said that this continuous revolution concept mass line concept won't continue and instead focus should be on economic development because china was on the in the primary stage of socialism so for the next 100 years this was said in the 1980s china would focus on just on economic development under the rule of the communist party that is one of the four cardinal principles the socialist road would be followed communist party would be the cardinal principles communist party would be would be the vanguard and uh, uh, marxism leninism mao zedong thought would be the main ideology but focus would be on economic development through reform and opening so uh, market economy would be introduced investments would be allowed foreign investment special economic zones would be established okay so this has been the the ideological position of the chinese communist party since 1978 now this whole concept of the vanguard party vanguard of the proletariat was introduced by lenin okay so that is known as leninism marxism leninism marx never talked about a political party leading the workers he believed that workers would revolt against the system but lenin argued that revolution has not happened it did not happen in the lifetime of marx and it did not happen even in the next uh, few uh, in the following few decades and so lenin argued that there is need for a elite class of people who are motivated towards revolution who are not who may not be workers they might come from the middle class because they need a certain amount of education okay so these people are going to form a communist party and lead the workers educate them organize them okay and thus become leaders of revolution so lenin himself belonged to that class okay so he believed that he will uh, they will lead a revolution and that is what happened ultimately uh, the bolshevik revolution of 1917 led by lenin overthrew the the uh, government of russia and established the uh, uh, the soviet state soviet russia which eventually after unity of uh, through the unity uh, of certain countries so russia ukraine belorussia and uh, trans caucasian states came together and they formed the soviet union another argument that lenin gave was the theory of imperialism marx had had not talked much about imperialism imperialism in the sense of uh, european powers colonizing the rest of the world in fact marx was in support of colonialism he believed that uh, colonialism had led to the advancement in the colonies okay they had advanced from the what, what was called the asiatic mode of production to a feudal society and then into the capitalist society without which a just society couldn't be established because marx believed in a in a you know kind of a preordained type of a uh, flow of history he believed that history moves through stages so those stages cannot be changed so countries in asia mainly at that time there was the ottomans or the ottoman empire china india so these had not and persia also so these had not developed a feudal society they had remained stuck in slave society and had turned into what he called the asiatic mode of, mode of production as a result they were not able to progress so basically the ruler ruled over the rest of the society as if they were slaves and everything was owned by the ruler okay so there was no concept of private property as is in uh, feudal society where the landlords are very powerful 
They are a check on the power of the king. There was no such thing in Asia. As a result, capitalism cannot develop. And if capitalism could not develop, then socialism also couldn't develop. But Lenin disagreed with, with Marx on this. And he said that imperialism actually supported the capitalist. Because the capitalists were able to exploit the colonies. So he called it, uh, uh, he called imperialism the highest stage of capitalism. That is, the, the, the capitalist powers were able to exploit their colonies, take away their wealth, and then pay better wages to the workers in their own countries. As a result, the chances of a revolution had declined. Okay. So, this is the theory of imperialism. So, there is a core, that is the colonizers, the European powers, they are the core, and then there is a proletariat, uh, 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 sorry, uh, there is a periphery. So, there is a core and there is a periphery. So, periphery are the colonies which are exploited by the core. Okay, they take their resources and they use the, the periphery as, as markets. Okay, they uh, produce finished goods which are sold in the periphery and then the profit goes to the, to the core. And as a result, the core becomes prosperous, the workers also become prosperous. As a result, there is no need for revolution. They, they are happy with the exploitative system because it is not they who are being exploited but the colonies which are being exploited. So, Lenin argued that a precondition to revolution was freedom of these colonies from the European powers. Okay, Soviet Union, he, he believed so Russia was the weakest link in, in the capitalist system because Soviet Union was not a very advanced capitalist state. And, and so, he believed that it was possible to have a revolution in Russia. I, I, I am, uh, you know, interchanging this word Soviet Union. Soviet Union came into existence in 1920s. Okay, before that it was Russia. For then it ceased to exist in 1992 and, uh, and we now have back Russia. Anyhow, so he, he, he supported nationalist movements in, in, the, in what came to be known as the third world countries or the colonies. For example, in China through the Comintern, okay, the communist international. And the Chinese Communist Party was the product of this support extended by Lenin. So, that is Marxism, Leninism, idea of Marx that was revised by Lenin. Now, I have already discussed in detail the contribution of Mao Zedong, his concept of new democracy, I already mentioned, Marx line that is mobilizing the peasants and, and, the, uh, and the youth to achieve uh, revolutionary goals and then party rectification. Okay, so, in order to come to power, he, he from time to time you know, purged the communist party. He believed that although the, the communist party is the ruling party, although uh, a socialist uh, state had been established, the mindset had not changed. People in the leadership and within society still have capitalist tendencies. Okay, and so, for time to time or they have some wrong tendencies, either it is deviation towards the left becoming too radical, okay, ignoring stability completely or becoming moving towards the right, advocating a more capitalist type of, of, of processes. For example, uh, you know, uh, remuneration connected with, with uh, productivity. So, these he considered to be capitalist policies supported by Liu Shaoqi and Tang Xiaoping. So, there is a need for rectifying the party from time to time. There is, remove, uh, there is a need to remove the tendencies, these uh, deviant tendencies, so that, you know, socialism is restored, socialist idea is restored. So, that is Mao Zedong thought. So, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought and then Tang Xiaoping theory. As I have already mentioned, I discussed in the previous lecture, the transition of China from Mao to market into the into what is known as market socialism. Okay, so, based on reform and opening plus the four cardinal principles. So, at this stage, I would like to stop. I uh, will discuss these doctrines and also the structure of the Communist Party state in the next lecture. So, we are going to divide basically this Chinese political system into part 1 and part 2. So, here I end the part 1 of the lecture. Thank you.
Confucian cosmology is a very interesting way of understanding the Chinese mind. A lot of emphasis has been made on how the Chinese mind works. People are very curious about knowing uh, this. Uh, so this may be, perhaps this will help you to get some idea about the Chinese mind. So in the Confucian uh, cosmology, the most important aspect is heaven. Heaven is at the top. Now heaven here does not refer to some kind of a uh, Abrahamic heaven where, or, or even a Buddhist heaven. It, it, heaven here simply means some kind of a cosmic law, some kind of power that controls everything happening in, on earth. So that is heaven. So heaven is what decides what the course of events on earth. And there is an intermediary between the heaven and earth that is the state. So son of heaven or emperor and today's times you can call it state. So state is an intermediary. The state has to represent heaven on earth and therefore people have to be obedient to uh, the state. So just like people are obedient to heaven because if they don't, uh, if they are not obedient to heaven, the heaven is going to punish them through natural calamities, through problems and enemies and so on. Similarly, the state because it represents heaven, people have to be obedient to the state and if in case they go against the state, they will be punished. Of course, if the state goes against heaven, if the state is uh, uh, promoting things which are uh, against the truth, so then people can revolt and, 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 and the situation would be very unstable in such, such, a, such a condition because uh, heaven would punish the state through natural calamities, foreign aggression, internal disturbances and, and so you can identify when the state no longer has the mandate of heaven. In this particular type of a thinking, there is a whole four occupation system. The gentry is at the top. So gentry today say would refer to the cadre of the Communist Party who are basically the rulers of China. Then the peasants. So food production is considered to be very important in China. Perhaps this hierarchy has changed a bit in, in the current situation. Then artisans. These are uh, people working in say industry today. And then merchants would be I think higher in the current system. So be below gentry maybe merchants and then artisans and then the peasants. So the hierarchy has changed a bit in, in modern China. But there is a hierarchy. And then there is a hierarchy of state relations also, interstate relations. So China is at the center. So China first and then there are tributaries, the countries which are friendly towards China, which accept the supremacy of China. So they are considered to be tributary states. Say for example, the Pakistan, North Korea, Pakistan of course keeps changing, sometimes it is allied with US, sometimes with China. So North Korea has been consistent after the collapse of Soviet Union, it has been more pro-China. There are some other countries like Cambodia, Laos which, which are and even Central Asian republics which are friendly towards China and China is now trying to pull Russia also into this orbit of tributary states. And then there are countries which uh, do not accept the superiority of China. They, they try to behave with China as equals or even superior. So those countries are considered to be barbarians. So generally it is Japan, or United States, India, these are considered to be barbarians in type, this type of a point of view. It is very interesting application of Confucian cosmology to current Chinese understanding. Thank you.